In October of 1998, Honduras was struck by a, a catastrophic hurricane, Hurricane Mitch. And Hurricane Mitch just wrought unbelievable devastation in the country. And it wasn't so much the winds, it was the fact that the storm came and just sat over Honduras for days and days and dumped a huge amounts of water. And so the rivers flooded, bridges were wiped out. Uh, and what really wrought a lot of the damage was in the capital city of Tegucigalpa and up in the mountains, there were mudslides. Because uh, in the capital, there was a lot of clearing of land to build homes, and so there was nothing to hold the soil together. But even in the mountains, that was so saturated that, that just the huge swaths of, of soil let go and just plowed through homes. I remember seeing a home that was filled up almost to the ceiling with mud. So in response to that, we decided to come and study Spanish in Honduras and at the same time engage in some very small scale relief efforts, helping people build houses again and recover from, from this hurricane. When we first came here, we live on the outskirts of the uh, small colonial city in the middle of the country. Uh, we encountered a great deal of poverty, just um, on a scale that, that most Americans don't ever experience firsthand. And one of the big unmet needs had to do with medicine and healthcare. So people would come to our door with uh, prescriptions from the local health clinic that they couldn't fill, with prescriptions for medical tests and exams that they didn't have money to do. And so we began to respond to that. But again, there was this kind of background awareness that this that's kind of like a drop in the bucket, you know, to the, to the need that was here. The crucial factor that led to the establishment of St. Benedict Joseph Medical Center was um, the experience of two unnecessary deaths of children um, with people that we had contact with here. One happened right here in Comayagua. Um, it was a baby, boy, uh, infant, I should say, maybe toddler, two, three years of age. His mother was a very, very simple woman. Um, he had gone to the public hospital and was sent home. Again, it was hard to know exactly what was communicated to the mother, what she understood, uh, but the boy died at home um, from something that seemed to be able to be treated. We did the, the funeral right here in the, the friar. He was, not, he was not baptized and went to family to bury the child. It was a very disturbing experience for me. At the same time, uh, a boy of around 14, young man, adolescent, from a mountain village way up uh, where we had done a housing project, had been brought to the city. Uh, and as a matter of fact, this is the, the kind of interesting thing of the story. Two of our friars were up in the mountain doing that project. And they uh, were there when the boy was sent down to the public hospital with dengue. Again, the, all the details are not clear, but it, there was a strike in, at the hospital at the time. And uh, somehow this 14 year old boy died. It's very difficult for me to think that that death couldn't have been prevented. And so the friars had to help, as we often did, take the body of the boy in the pickup back up to the village and meet the family. And again, you can imagine the, yeah, just the weight of that and the sadness, especially in the light of the fact that maybe this could have been different. So with the weight of these two deaths still very much uh, impacting us, at that time, there was the gospel of the story of the man who brings his son to Jesus, uh, first to the apostles who can't do anything, and then to Jesus, and he's like, what's wrong with you guys? You should be able to do something. Uh, and it was like those words were directed to me personally. So anyway, the idea was born that we, we need to do something. So I began, there's a little argument between myself and the, uh, the uh, founder of Light of the World Charities as to whose idea it was. But I did present it to them and to the community. And so the process began. The entire facility was constructed in less than a year for less than half a million dollars, which is a miracle in itself. And the, 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 the target population was exactly the population that tended to be overlooked even by the public health system here in Honduras. Uh, and that would be campesinos, people from the mountains, the villages, because even in the public hospital, they're so, in a sense, timid uh, when they're outside of their environment that they're always the last in line and they always can be walked over. Uh, see, for us, that's the first kind of person that we wanted to serve. And so one of the things that I would always try to communicate to the staff is we want to be like the inverse of the way things normally happen. So that the people who are most neglected, most overlooked, least able to pay, 
are the people who are on the top of our list and to make it a place that would be friendly for them. Because one of the other things that we found was that people's medical awareness and knowledge was not necessarily very well developed here. So for example, the concept of an antibiotic that you have to take a complete cycle of would not be something that would be easily graspable by somebody from that situation. Well, I feel better, I should just stop taking the medicine. Or the fact that some medicines have to be mixed with purified water, otherwise you're, whatever good you're doing is being canceled by the, the, the impure water that you're using. So one of the other things we wanted to do was make it a place where people would take the time to make sure that people understood. In other words, a place that was suited to the, not only the medical needs, but also the, the human context of the people that we were serving. Um, and it was the experience for us, I know for me personally, as were the situations in La Paz, but even more so here, of just seeing uh, incredible faith and love in the families that would come. But we would meet people who would come at great sacrifice from mountain villages, having to sell. Remember one lady, every time she came down with her daughter, they would have to sell a chicken. And they didn't have that many. I mean, it's always like you could watch the population of the, the flock of chickens go down as they made their trips down. Another young couple just coming down, they, they just heard that, uh, that, that San Benito was there and they took the risk of faith and came. And I would like to focus on one particular family that we got to know through the medical center. It's a very poignant, uh, beautiful uh, testimony to faith. There was an older woman named Elvina um, she, during Hurricane Mitch, she had lost all of her siblings and all of her children except for one. So she had an adult daughter who had a girl um, and then later on had a, uh, a boy. So she just had two kids. The boy was born with a physical uh, deformity and a, a medical condition. And this really bothered the mother. So one day, randomly, they just showed up at our front door. They had heard about the medical center. It wasn't the time of a surgical mission. We didn't have the particular specialist that this little boy needed, but the, the, this woman who was just like pure faith showed up at the front door. And of course, I mean, there she is, an older woman, her adult daughter in a wheelchair, two small kids. So we, naturally we received them and we began to work with them. And as it turned out, this, this boy needed a very particular type of specialist to address his, his need. And somehow, really through the providence of God and through the network of people that we were able to establish, a specialist, a pediatric specialist in the area that this boy needed came on a, on a surgical mission. And it actually required a significant amount of preparation. We had to send some samples back to the United States. There was a lot of test work that had to be done to see what could be possible in this particular case. But finally, the boy was operated on and there needed to be some follow-up treatment on this. But the little boy was so excited that he just ran around his village and ran around the village. I'm, I'm healed, I'm better, I'm better. And just, just almost overflowing, uh, exploding with joy. You can't take responsibility for this because so many factors just kind of come into play and appear. I mean, if there's anything, it's being able to say, well, maybe we can connect this dot with this dot, but I didn't put the dots there. So there's this overwhelming sense of participating in something that is really beyond you. How else do you explain it? How else do you explain that something like this uh, exists and has continued to exist for 15 years? And I think there's been, well, been over 200,000 medical appointments there, but we estimate that the center has cared for at least 100,000 individual people. 100,000. There's still great need, but that's that's something significant. And it's been done in the name of Christ. It's been done as a gesture of the church. Um, and it's something that invites, I think, all of us to make a response. It is a beautiful work of God uh, for which it is a privilege to participate.